for future reference for if people want to go back and listen. Um, I hope you're all doing really well. We're so happy to have you for the webinar on Keeping Kids Healthy and in School, How School-Based Health Centers Can Help Reduce Chronic Absence. And we um, have three panelists today, well, myself and two panelists, and we're just getting used to um, sharing our slides, so bear with us. Um, some quick housekeeping. Um, everyone who's attending is automatically on listen-only mode. You don't need to do anything to make that happen. Um, you can listen via your computer or the phone, but phone tends to come across better. So you can see the call-in number here. So if you're not hearing us very well, maybe try that. Um, you can also send a chat if you're having difficulty hearing or you're having other problems. Um, we will have time for questions and answers at the end. In fact, we're holding at least 10 minutes. Um, so feel free to send in questions via the chat box um, throughout the entire presentation, and we'll collect them and have time for the panelists to answer them at the end. Um, I'm sorry, my recording button is in the middle of my slides. Um, this webinar, as I said, is being recorded, and it will be on our website along with any other supporting material by the end of next week. So um, if you want to come back to it or direct other people or don't get to hear the whole thing, you'll be able to hear that there. I mean, go back to that there. Our website, of course, is www.schoolhealthcenters.org. And um, I just want to welcome our, our panelists. Um, we have Cecilia Leung from Attendance Works, um, Julianne Sparks from Rosa Parks Elementary School, which is part of San Diego Unified. And then I'm here as the host. I'm Amy Ranger, and the Director of Programs at the California School-Based Health Alliance. So thank you um, to Cecilia and Julianne for joining us, and thank you to the um, 105 people who are, are, are joining us today. Um, most of you hopefully already know this, but just as a quick reminder, um, the California School-Based Health Alliance is a statewide nonprofit that's dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. So we do this in a lot of different ways, and hopefully you're familiar with some of our other work, but we support um, brick-and-mortar school-based health centers, and we support school health programming, even if there isn't an actual freestanding school-based health center. Um, we have all sorts of training and technical assistance and written tools that are available for free um, to anyone in the education or healthcare fields or anyone who's interested in improving health services in schools. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some other um, things that you can tap into to get more information, but we really want to support you all and the work you're doing, so please reach out to us and let us know um, how we can be most helpful to you. Um, just a quick plug, we are a membership organization, um, and we um, would we would like to have all 268 school-based health centers and their school districts and other partners as members of the organization. Um, some of the benefits of membership are reduced uh, registration costs for our conference, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end, um, as well as additional tools and technical assistance hours from our staff. So um, check out our website, see what's there, and if your organization is not already a member, please consider becoming one. Um, and from there, I'm going to um, pass it over to Cecilia and say again, thank you so much for joining us. This is such an important topic, and we're so excited to be talking about attendance and school-based health center um, collaboration. Passing it to Cecilia. Thank you so much, Amy, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back here in California. Um, many of you may know Attendance Works, and for those of you who don't, we are a not-for-profit that works to advance student success and close equity gaps by reducing chronic absence. And we work at the policy, practice, communication, and research levels. So we work very hard to provide the resources to practitioners and uh, many others who need the right ideas in order to address chronic absenteeism. So why is chronic absence so important? Why does it matter to, to us? So first, let's start with a definition. In California, uh, we define chronic absence as missing 10% or more of school for any reason. And this is a real shift in how we think of attendance. It includes all absences, which are missed opportunities to learn. 
So we're looking at excused absences, unexcused, and days missed due to suspensions. This is really a big shift from our traditional way of looking at attendance as either average daily attendance or uh, truancy, which is only looking at unexcused absences. So improving attendance really matters because when kids are absent, there are many, many negative consequences. Beginning in kindergarten and first grade, um, chronic absence really has an impact on children gaining their academic foundational knowledge. So that by third grade, when kids are chronically absent, we see many of them unable to read on grade level. And if it continues in middle school, we see students failing their courses, and by high school, they're much more likely to drop out. Uh, conversely, being in school, uh, having good attendance is strongly uh, associated with academic success. So we see kids coming in um, in early grades ready to learn and uh, developing their social and emotional capacities by third grade, being on track and reading proficiently, which is so critical to success in later grades. By middle school, students who attend regularly are more likely to have passing grades and by high school, more likely to graduate and go on to college or career ready for adult life. And we also have some evidence that students who attend regularly uh, in high school are more likely to persist in college and to graduate. And so it is it's critical, not just as a summative measure, but we really see chronic absence as a warning sign of academic risk. We also know here in California, because we are so focused on making sure that all kids, uh, every group, really can succeed, that chronic absence has a heavy impact um, on particular vul particularly vulnerable student groups. And so kids who live in poverty are more likely to experience chronic absence. Um, kids who uh, are chronically absent and have less uh, resources, kids living in poverty, have a harder time catching up for that lost learning time. Um, and the pattern is likely to persist. So today, uh, what's so exciting is that I'm not only talking to a, an educator audience, but talking to folks who are uh, representing school-based health centers as well. And chronic absence really is a cross-cutting metric. It's a warning sign often that there's a health-related condition that needs to be addressed. So um, why a student in school is often because they are sick. Chronic absence is also a predictor of worse education and health outcomes. And so um, it may be stating what's obvious to many of us, but it's not um, a one-way relationship uh, between health and education. When kids are um, not well, they have less access to school, they miss more days, and as a result, um, they are not graduating, which is what we're talking about, and it leads to that cycle of poverty repeating. And being um, sick or having poor health also makes it harder to access uh, schooling. So we are really entering a new era of accountability for attendance here in California. Our um, California school dashboard now includes chronic absenteeism um, as part of our accountability in our school system. And what I really want to say about this is that it's so tempting for us to think that this is a school result measure, but it is more than that. Um, really, when you think about what it takes to reduce chronic absenteeism, you quickly realize that schools can't reduce um, chronic absenteeism alone. To really move the needle, we need to have um, many partners, including school-based health centers, working together. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to address the underlying conditions. So let me say um, just a couple of words about um, how many students we're really talking about. Um, so from the most recent data, we know that chronic absence is really a significant issue here in California. We have over 700,000 students chronically absent 
in school year 2017-18. That's an 11% chronic absence rate. And we see that it disproportionately affects um, our vulnerable subgroups. And so you can see much higher rates for particular ethnic groups here as an example. So how can school-based health centers help reduce chronic absenteeism? How can schools work together um, with their health partners? So at Attendance Works, we really think that a team approach is key to providing a comprehensive tiered strategy to address chronic absenteeism that really moves um, the focus away from uh, high cost late interventions to uh, universal school interventions and early intervention. And to do that, you really need a team working together. So at the school level, we really advocate for a school attendance team that's led by the principal and has diverse representation. I really want to highlight um, the importance of having health providers as part of this team. Um, in this particular graphic, it might be the school nurse, um, it might be community partners that represent outside organizations, and I would suggest that it has to be someone that links to the school-based health center. So the great thing about school-based health centers is they're right there in, in the school and uh, available to students and families. But I suggest that it has to be more than just sharing a space that there actually needs to be a connection in terms of working together um, in the attendance team um, and throughout the day in order to um, ensure that the students who are chronically absent really get the attention they, they need. So in addition to um, our tiered uh, uh, comprehensive system of support, I want to suggest that there's also a tiered health framework for chronic absenteeism, where we want to make sure that across the school building, there's access to school-wide health screenings, that we have a safe and clean and healthy school environment, that we educate families to prevent unnecessary health-related absences, and that there's monitoring of school health and attendance data. Um, the early intervention piece is key providing referrals to health care providers when students are missing 10% or as little as two days a month, including the school nurse on student planning and developing school plans for students with chronic illnesses such as asthma. And then, of course, where we traditionally focus is making sure that there's intensive case management for the kids who need that additional level of support. Excuse me. So just, it's really important that we have different health-related uh, interventions. Um, different causes require different interventions. And just as you, an educator can't live with a simple diagnosis like the student can't read, it's not, that's not sufficient to guide you on what actions to take. On the health side, out sick isn't a specific enough uh, diagnosis to provide appropriate treatment. So having the uh, school-based health center, working with the attendance team, working with educators, really helps identify when a child is sick, what's really going on. Is it an acute illness? Is it a chronic condition? Is it a mental health issue or something else? So that they can provide appropriate interventions um, at the earliest sign of chronic absenteeism. So I've presented a lot of information that may sound theoretical to some of you who don't have a school-based health center at your school. Um, so what I want to do at this point is turn to a real-life example of uh, someone who works in a school, in a school-based health center, who's really making a difference on getting kids to school healthy and ready to learn. So it's my pleasure to invite Julianne Sparks to um, share some information about what she does at Rosa Parks Elementary School in San Diego. So welcome, Julianne. Thank and you. I want, yes, so I want to just start out by asking you to share a couple of sentences 
us about your role at Rosa Parks Elementary School. Absolutely. So here I am, the registered credentialed school nurse. So my role is all the things that you think of as a school nurse, dealing with nurses' passes for illness and injury, routine medication, daily medication for diabetes care, ADHD, as well as asthma inhalers, emergency meds. I train staff and I deal with mandated screenings and IEP assessments and follow up with immunizations. But the um, biggest role that we're going to discuss here today is really how I'm able to be a conduit and um, a bridge builder. And I'm actually the liaison here at the school that makes sure that students and families have access to the health care that they need here at our school-based clinic. Oh, fantastic. Um, I'm really looking forward to the uh, concrete examples you're going to share. But first, Tell us a bit about the students and families at Rosa Parks. Absolutely. So um, the slide you're seeing now is actually our clinic. We share the same physical space in between the health center and Mid-City Community Clinic. We do have a nurse practitioner here five days a week as well as a mental health care professional. Moving into the demographics of our students. What you're seeing right now is a representation of meal eligibility. So this is a sign of whether or not students require assistance to have free breakfast in the classroom as well as lunch. It's based on the level of household number and the level of before taxes uh, income. So what you see here is that 95.4% 95 of students here are eligible to receive those services. That means that they are at the poverty level right here. An example of how much that means, that means that a household of four makes less than $33,000 before taxes a year. Now, based on these numbers, we are 100% um, service providers for this. So it's not that there is any portion of our population that doesn't receive the services, because it's deemed that all uh, are in need. Uh -huh. The next demographic. Yeah, not kind of shocking there. Um, the next demographic I'd like to share is about the languages that are spoke here at Rosa Parks. I chose to look into language because it is so closely bound to culture and it also um, really speaks to our, uh, our communication needs between students and their parents. By primary language, it means what language the parent reports is the first language um, for that student, as well as the language that is spoken at home. What you see here is that 86% are non-English, with 70% reporting that Spanish is spoken in the home, and 7% reporting that Vietnamese is spoken in the home. Uh, we do also ask families to sort of uh, self-report what ethnicity they, will, uh, they, they deem themselves. <laughs> and those numbers come up even higher. That ends up with about 80% saying that they are uh, Hispanic and about 13% being Vietnamese. And you can see that we do have a lot of other languages involved there, too. Mm -hmm. Great diversity and a lot of newcomer families. Yes, there is a lot of first generation here to the U.S., many refugees. Uh, additional factors, parents do report that only uh, that 38.4% report that they have not uh, graduated high school, as well as a bit over 8% saying that they didn't want to even state. So we can sort of assume that about 40% have not achieved an educational level of high school, which is what our goal is for the next generation, obviously, if not college or even greater. Uh, another factor here is that uh, specialized education, so special ed, about 12.6% have an IEP and are receiving services here at the school. And that might mean that they have a specific learning disability that uh, is affecting how they can access their education or an other health impairment like ADHD or ADD or are receiving speech services. Um, that number, we do have many students that are still being evaluated. So I do believe that that number is actually a little bit low right now and that we'll see as the school year goes on that we might have a, a bit more. But at least a, a three students in every classroom do, does require extra services to access their education. 
Mm. So that's a pretty uh, large proportion who who need that assistance and extra support. Yeah, absolutely. And here are the chronic absence is uh, with some schools that are in the geographic area with us. So looking to make this graph, we really looked at what are the neighboring schools from Rosa Parks right here. If you're familiar with the San Diego area, these are schools that are found in City Heights. It's in east of the I-15, uh, south of the, the I-8. These are the schools that are surrounding sort of our neighborhood. They're all elementary schools as well. On the graph, you can see the ones in green are the ones that do have a school-based health center. And you can see that the chronic absenteeism is on the lower end. Uh, this uh, data was taken from our day 70, so this was back in December. Uh, statistics are always kind of fluctuating a bit, but you can see the very dark bar is right there with Rosa Parks being at a 14.5%. Yeah, and I, I know it's not like directly comparable, but given that they're in the same neighborhoods and um, the ones with the school-based health center seem to have lower uh, chronic absence rates is suggestive of some sort yeah. of relationship. So um, let's go on and talk a bit mm -hmm. about why school-based health centers are needed at Rosa Parks. Absolutely. So what we really have here is we have an at-risk population. So when we were looking um, earlier in the slides and talking about vulnerable populations, uh, there's a lot of health concerns that I see here. Definitely asthma. I have over 50 students that have asthma. Students with anaphylaxis, uh, such severe food allergies or bee sting allergies. Many students do require uh, support with medication for ADHD or other behavior issues there, seizures, students with diabetes. We have toileting issues, including incontinence as well as constipation. A lot of students have anxiety and other issues like that. Uh, so really, if we look back to that meal eligibility, we can see the poverty level uh, these families and students are living in. And that's a, a very much a barrier to off-site care because they may not have reliable transportation. They may not have money that they can pay for the gas, even if they do have a car, bus passes are a limit. And several do car share. So they might have one working vehicle for a household. And many households too, although not necessarily uh, seen as being homeless, they are what we call doubling up. So families are living together in a single household based on financial needs and um, are having limited resources and overcrowding. And one of those limited resources is transportation. So the, yeah, the way that uh, having a school-based health clinic sort of reduces that barrier is that we are inherently at a walkable distance. Every student that is within our area, our neighborhood that is designated to come to our school is within a walkable distance, which means that their health care access is also walkable right here in a familiar area. That's a huge advantage. And I would imagine that for some of the um, families, the adults are working at jobs where there isn't a lot of flexibility in terms of their hours or their time available to take their students anywhere. Um, even if they have yeah. transportation. Absolutely not. And many of um, our students are actually with a lot of family members. So at times they can have an aunt or a grandparent or another adult, and that adult obviously can get here to us, even if mom and dad are at work with the only car. Yes. Mm -hmm. So say some more about um, the advantages We've talked about the geographic advantages of just having the school-based health center right there. Talk about the language access piece, because I was really struck by how many languages were spoken um, by the students' families at Rosa Parks. Absolutely. And I think that the languages is, is really tied into the cultural as well as um, that fits in with the parent educational level as well. So here at Rosa Parks, we do have full-time staff that are completely bilingual in Spanish as well as Vietnamese. Uh, 
Um, and the things to remember too is that it, with these home languages, sometimes parents may be functionally illiterate in any language. So just sending home a form that's been translated into Burmese or into another language doesn't necessarily mean that you're really making true communication. So as before with the geographic, a parent can physically come here and we can have that verbal communication back and forth with that live staff member, or we also have access to calling in for a whole host of translation services with languages, as well as the school district has translation services. But I, I think that it, the, the real thing is, is having a welcoming place, a person who's here willing and using those translation tools to make sure that messages truly do get across and questions get answered here. Absolutely wonderful, um, and those are great examples of how you create that true communication, not one way I sent a form and who knows who read it, right, but really having that uh, effective face-to-face. -face. I love the examples, and I, I can tell we're verging into the, um, the solution, so talk to me about <laughs> I, I love your energy. Talk to me a bit about how these <laughs> health clinics, real, health centers help with attendance. Give some examples. Absolutely. Here we go. So one of the things that I adore is that we have what we call an AM assessment. So what we offer to absolutely every single parent, family, student here is that they can bring their student here to the school into the health office in the morning and we will check them out. We will do an assessment and see, are they too ill to participate? Are they contagious? Do they just need a slightly modified day? Um, or do they need to go home for monitoring? So this, this really goes across all of the tiers of attendance, as well as all of the tiers that were discussed with the health needs. And um, one of the great things about it is that even though it is sort of the illness verification that many people are familiar with when you're getting into the tier two and tier three, um, students that are having real trouble with absenteeism, there's not that negative connotation because it is open and for all, and it's really a matter of getting kids what they need right now at the time instead of it being follow up and the sort of negative we're checking up. So this is available to any student. Yes, any student in absolutely. And that's so critical because something I've been seeing, Julianne, is that I think we've been um, trying to figure out, okay, so how do you reduce the uh, unnecessary health-related uh, illnesses, right? When really the child's well enough and if the parent feels reassured by a health professional, they can come to school. But we're starting to see the opposite happening, which is parents are sending kids when they're really too sick to be in school. And this is one of those perverse um, impacts of the new accountability system. We're emphasizing attendance and parents don't know the opposite or don't think the opposite, and they send their kid when they're too sick. So, And really, what, yeah, what we want to think there, too, is, is is the student contagious? Is this an issue that needs to be stayed at home? Or is it just a matter of education and prevention? Because if you send one truly sick kid into a classroom, well, what's going to happen? Other kids are going to get sick, too. And so you will end up with more students being out when it could have been preventable with that single one student who was feverish going home. Great so point. We, yeah, we emphasize the fever check because a lot of parents will come in and say, oh, my student had a fever. And I say, well, what was the number? And they say, well, they were hot to the touch. Hmm. <laughs> so we actually give out thermometers right here in the, you see a picture of them, and that's for use at home so that parents can really understand what is the fever and what does that mean? What's the follow-up that needs to be done for that? And also, you know, ensuring that they do know what needs to be done with that fever because sometimes it's, it's home monitoring. It's, it's just a virus that's probably going to pass, but we really don't want it to pass on to anyone else. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. How many thermometers do you think you gave out this year? Oh, um, lots. I would say we went through boxes and boxes. I need to reorder. I'll put it that way. Super. Uh, <laughs> Super. That's great. 
Um, so tell me some more because I, I know that you actually have a lot of thoughts on this issue and I don't want to miss out on anything. I think the audience in particular would love to hear what you're doing. Absolutely. So what I see in my real life experience here is real opportunity for care coordination and communication, especially around asthma. Like I said, I have about 50 students that I know of that have asthma. Oh. And uh, I have the, yeah, the ability, not only with the morning check-in, to check their lungs to see if they're clear, but to also follow up with their parents. Are they taking their uh, maintenance medication, that routine medication at home that needs to be taken all the time to prevent flare-ups? Or are they only relying on a rescue inhaler? Uh, a lot of time when I follow up on, on illnesses for attendants, they'll say, oh, well, they were in the ER. You go, wow, okay, well, you know, in the ER for asthma, well, what are they doing how can we make it so that they're not going to be in the ER? Because that's definitely an escalation we want to prevent, and that's missed days that are there. So I can have this ability when the provider is right here at Mid-City, when I'm following up on their orders and I have a parent that says they were in the ER for asthma, I can check my orders here and talk to the provider. Just recently found that um, on one example for a student is that uh, when the um, the report to the provider was that everything was great. There was no flare-ups anytime lately. And here I'm like, oh, but he's been in the hospital twice in the last two months for his asthma. We need to change and we need to educate to make sure this doesn't happen again. Wow, uh, great example. Quickly share the other examples mm -hmm. that, um, that are on your slide. What, how yes. do you coordinate and communicate? So because we do have a clinic here that offers all of the vaccinations that are required for school entry, uh, if a parent is trying to come and enroll their student and I'm checking their immunization records and I see that they're lacking, I don't have to send them off site to go to the county. If they're moving new into our neighborhood, I can say, here you go. Why don't you come enroll? We'll help you fulfill your Medi-Cal if that's lapsed and you can get those immunizations today and be in your, in the, and that student can be in their seat attending school tomorrow, as well as it, it comes up too when students have been enrolled and um, they need their immunizations to be kept up to date. So this comes up with refugees or people that are coming from other countries, people that didn't start off with their immunization record in the normal, uh, in the normal uh, routine of it. So what we can do is we can have them offer the vaccine right here, and so we don't have to exclude. Those of you nurses that are out there listening, you know those lists that you have of the student that's going to be due for their next polio or and, and at midtime or this, that, and the other, and what we can really offer is to have it taken care of right here, right now, so that we don't have to exclude them and make them absent for weeks at a time while they're waiting to get in for that appointment to update that immunization to get that vaccine that keeps them safe. Great. And so tell me about the last two examples, and I have a last question for you before I let others in the audience ask you questions. Yes. So um, because we do have that nurse practitioner here five days a week, and we do have a mental health provider one day a week, many of our students can come in and have their health exams right here at school and absolutely are missing only that 45 minutes from class. Instead of being come, checked out, taken out, gone even just down the road and then back, and you see so many times that students have a doctor's appointment and they've been absent the entire school day based on that one doctor's appointment, we can relieve that, absolutely. They're, they come, they see the clinic, they go right back to class. So it reduces so much of actual time and entire days that have been missed for that. And then, um, the next example is with our IEPs. We can really have open communication. I've even had parents um, offer to have resource teachers come and sit in and speak directly to the healthcare provider as a team so that we understand what the concerns are and what's moving forward so that that medical treatment and that education program can really be truly merged together so that everyone is aware of the concerns and everyone is working together to give the supports necessary to access a full education. And that's just really unprecedented. I don't know of anywhere else where you would have a, an, a special ed resource teacher being able to, to really have that group collaboration communication with their healthcare provider. 
Julianne, I love these examples mm-hmm. because what they add up to is uh, quicker access to health care and support and less time out of the classroom for all the students. This is marvelous. Let me ask you my last mm-hmm. question. Sure. So what is, I talked earlier about the importance of being part of the attendance team and linking that with the school-based health center. Talk about how you connect with that attendance team in your school. Yes, so we do have a weekly team and it's made up of diverse members. It looks a lot like your slide there with the bubble. We have people that are there that are teachers, school counselors, our attendance team, and myself there for it. So what I can offer for that is really the individualized records review. Figure out what is the illness? What do we have recorded for that student? What is new? What's different? What's happening? Are these illnesses acute? Are they chronic? How can we help manage them? So it's really making sure the documentation is there moving forward and it's the follow-up and outreach with families. I can talk to the parents and then uh, provide information based on our protocols, but mostly it's getting them here to the clinic or or to a clinic so that there's that care coordination illness prevention and that we don't end up with um, kiddos in the ER for these issues. And um, we really do have a community needs review. So I'm looking towards what's going around, what are we seeing, Uh, seasonal concerns with the flu, if students are out with the flu, what can we do to keep the population as a whole healthy based on what we're seeing with those vulnerable students that have already come up to um, the attendance team and this is just a great opportunity to offer resources. Are such fantastic thoughts and examples. Julianne, thank you so much. And I, I can see that um, many people have questions. So, Amy, mm-hmm. I'm going to turn to you to help us uh, answer as many as possible in the time that we have left. That is perfect. Thank you both so much. So informative and so helpful. Um, I am indeed getting lots of great questions, both through the chat box and through the Q&A box, so um, attendees should feel free to use either, and I will combine them and um, send them to our panelists. Um, We have a few sort of great questions about first steps, so let's start with that. Um, The first one is, what might be the first steps for school administrators even just to start an attendance team? So um, maybe, Cecilia, that would be a good one for you. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I think in addition to the principal who is key because nothing happens really in a school building without principal uh, leadership and support, um, I would encourage you to think through who can do the things that are needed for an attendance team. So I would encourage you to think about whoever it is who tracks your student attendance. Usually it's the school secretary or clerk so that you have the data there. And then if you have a school-based health center or a nurse, um, I would add that person because we know that um, health-related absences are usually one of the biggest reasons why kids miss school. Um, And then just think through um, who you need on the team, get organized. We actually have materials um, at Attendance Works advising you um, on how to form and run a good attendance team. So I will... Um, during the pause, go get that link for you and uh, put it in the chat box. Perfect. And we can send out, not only are we going to post the webinar um, and the slides on our website, but we'll also post any supplementary materials so we can um, post that link as well. Um, The next one, Julianne, I think might be good for you. Um, What might be the first step for a school-based health center to start supporting school administrators that maybe haven't um, directed their focus to reducing absence yet? Um, you know, we know that there's a lot on school administrators' plate, and so if they haven't been able to start an attendance team or um, focus in that direction, how can school-based health centers support them? I think um, when we're dealing with health in the schools, what we also have to really remember is to use educational language and to think about what priorities and pressures are being put on those administrators. Because it's great for us to say that we all intuitively absolutely know that healthy kids learn better, but how do we prove that? How do we know? So I think that some of the, um, some of the data that we've seen just in this slide deck that can be shared when we start talking about tests, test grades, 
scores are all clearly linked to attendance. Health issues clearly link to attendance. If you want to think in the administrator's mind, how are they being graded? What are they being looked at when they're being evaluated? And if you can explain to them how crucial attendance and health is related to those test scores, those graduation rates, and even bring up that average daily attendance usually is factored into their budget. How much money do they have to do their own job? When you bring in all of those factors and with sort of a, a thought to the pressures that are put on educators and administrators, you can really start to see how it becomes a, a very focused um, presentation of how this helps you do your job and shine as an educator by helping us do our jobs as health providers. That's a great point. And actually, we've seen a lot of success from school-based health centers using this lever as a way of translating their value to school and district administrators. So showing that the impact of having school health services and a school-based health center on campus keeps kids in their seats, um, which does impact ADA, which does impact funding, and then of course, which we know has the long-term impact on educational outcomes. So um, like you said, this is the language, of course, that educators speak, and it's gonna be the most helpful language for healthcare providers to speak when talking to um, educators. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot more questions coming in, so I'll keep us going. Um, the next two questions might be for um, me to handle, which is explain the difference between a school-based health center and a regular school nurse's office, and then what might be the first step for a school that's interested in starting a school-based health center. Um, so um, some school nurses obviously have a wide range of capacity and FTE on any given school campus, but in general they are given um, mandates from the district about what they need to do with their time, and it is a particularly limit, limited scope and a limited practice, where school-based health centers are often multidisciplinary teams and often run by community partners or engaging community partners with even more services and more um, provider types present. So a school-based health center will often have a nurse practitioner, even a part-time pediatrician, usually some kind of behavioral health provider, um, occasionally even dental, um, health education, and our, uh, some of our newest school-based health centers actually have optical services as well. So the services are uh, much more comprehensive, um, and it's a multidisciplinary team that's able to, to uh, meet more of the student needs than a, than a school nurse might, um, just by virtue of having more capacity, more people, more service lines. Um, and that leads to the next question, which is the first step for a school that's interested in the a school-based health center, which is exactly what the California School-Based Health Alliance does, is help school districts and schools and healthcare providers launch new school-based health centers. So the first step would be to go to our website and reach out to us, and we will help get you on that path. Um, and, and again, of course, that's schoolhealthcenters.org. Um, we have whole webinars on that topic, so I won't take too much more time, but we're always excited to help people um, start more school-based health centers. Um, a quick question for um, Julianne that might be great for us also to send out is where's the best place to ob obtain educational materials, for example, on asthma? Oh, okay. Well, uh, if you do go to sandiegounified.org, we have fact sheets that are some basic um, lay terms that are, are meant to be sent out for the parents on many communicable diseases and issues. Um, it kind of depends on exactly what sort of resource you're looking for. Um, I can hmm. compile a few. Yeah, I can compile a few <laughs> resources, including the San Diego um, Unified School District website, and we'll include that in the um, materials we sent out. Right, and the other thing that really works out well is if you go to a MayoClinic.org, that can answer a lot of questions. Um, and then just contact, you know, local providers. I have a lot of information, a lot of insights that I do get just in networking. Um, I'm sure that there are many people that are willing to help. Um, around here, we do have radius children specialists that help us a lot with almost every disorder that you could possibly imagine. We really reach out to that radius children's hospital who works with the pediatric population all over San Diego, and I'm sure that they also have links for it. 
Um, this is a great question. How can health plans work with schools to support health education? Um, so I can see if Cecilia and Julian have anything, and then I can jump in. Maybe I'll just um, take that one. Can you repeat we have the to, question? <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. I can speak more clearly. Um, how can health plans work with schools to support health education? So by health plans, are we talking about insurance plans, or are we talking um, about creating um, plans, individualized like student plans? <laughs> insurance plans is my interpretation. Okay. Yeah, com confirming insurance plans. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I can I can jump in. This is Amy from CSHA, and um, yeah. we actually have done some great work with health plans that want to use both the schools, the districts, and the school-based health centers to reach their members um, to do more health education. So I'd love to have that conversation with you offline. Um, I can just reach out to you directly or you can shoot me a quick email. Um, some great examples that we've seen is some sort of carved out funds, um, some educational campaigns, you know, just creating these really uh, creative partnerships between health plans who know that their um, enrollees are part of particular schools or districts and saying, we want to do this prevention work. We want to support the amazing health education and prevention work that's happening. So I can tell you about some of those pilot projects that we've seen across the state. That would also be another great um, uh, webinar that we could set up. <laughs> um, Carla thinks I got your email right there. Perfect. Um, I have a great question for Julianne here. Given the high number of children in need of school needs, sorry, school meals, can you speak to the importance of breakfast in the classroom program at the school on student health and attendance? Absolutely. So our breakfast in the classroom program is actually, uh, it's, it's nationally funded is where we really um, get it from. But the number one thing you want to think about is what is nutrition mean for you? On a long-term basis, it's the basis for all of your health, whether or not you can fight off infection, whether you can heal, whether you can be vibrant and feel good. But what we also see here in school is that so many stomach aches and headaches and other distractions are based on missed meals. And those students can't concentrate and function in the classroom without having that basic fuel to help them, you know, to help them learn. Um, does that answer? Um, this is Cecilia. I would ask yeah. that um, I'm going to post a link to um, uh, mm -hmm. An example of breakfast in the classroom. It definitely, mm -hmm. in terms of chronic ab reducing chronic absenteeism, helping focus because none of us can really think mm -hmm. hungry. <laughs> and I think there's the additional benefit actually is if you do breakfast in the classroom and not meals in general, it also builds the sense of community and connectedness to the school, mm -hmm. which is a lovely thing. And we've seen some great examples of school-based health centers being sort of the, the advocacy and education voice for breakfast in the classroom. So Cecilia, I'll make a note that we want to make sure we send out, um, send out that link. Um, then there's a question of data. So people are really interested in seeing this data. And Julian, the data that you were referring to, I think, um, in answer to the question about translating to school administrators. So. I'm assuming you mean the, the chronic okay. absent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it, 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 my 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 audio cut out for a moment there. So I am I'm assuming a lot of what I'm referring to is general information that was shared with me and while I was getting my credentials. So off the top of my head, I can't pull off um um a a, a great number of scientifically based articles, but they are out there. I'm willing to bet that you guys probably have some resources that really do substantiate a lot of the connection between testing and attendance and all of those things. They are out there in evidence-based articles, but off the top of my head, the best way to get to those is a good question. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, Cecilia, go ahead. <laughs> I was to um, understand the question better in order to answer it properly. Um, I think if you're asking about the relationship between um, 
health and chronic absenteeism. Um, there's I, probably the one of the best summaries I just saw a couple of days ago was um, the American Association of Pediatrics just mm -hmm. published their policy statement on chronic absenteeism, um, and that's something I shared with you earlier this morning, Amy. And mm -hmm. the footnotes in there are pretty exhaustive, and it shows um, all those connections. Um, I was wondering if the question was, how do we find our chronic absence data, in which case that's a different uh, area. Um, and then we, but if it's the first question about the connections and the impacts, then I, I'd look at the American Association of Pediatrics article and I'd look at the research section on the Attendance Works website. Those would be two immediate places. That's where I was going to send folks as well. And if it was even the second layer is, um, data on the impact of having interventions and having school-based health centers to prevent absence um, and how that, that will keep students you know, in their seats and healthier. Um, and I can also send links to the, the data that we have around that. Um, yes, I, I think I'm seeing the notes that we want to convince the district that we need a school-based health center, so we can send out those, those data links um, as well. Great. Um, we're Almost out of time, but I'm just double checking that the last sections of questions all seem about resources and funding. So um, mm -hmm. maybe I think there's sort of one question for each of us. So Julianne, if you want to take, how has the school resourced this program? How do they pay for the nurse, and um, et cetera? And how can a school find funding for these services? Absolutely. I want to give credit where credit is due. The reason why we have the resources that we do have here is because of price philanthropies. So they match up with not only our school district resources that fund our nursing and, and wellness, but they are the ones who are making the school-based health clinic possible here. And so if you um, look back on that one slide that did say resources, you can go and visit priceforlanthropies.org. And it's specifically the City Heights Initiative is what's funding and allowing Rosa Parks to have what we have here in terms of being a community school model and all of us, they don't just fund that, they fund many, many more things. That's great. And then I think the piggyback question on that um, came from someone else about the typical mix of funding for school-based health centers, um, because unfortunately not every community has um, a price for philanthropies or a, um, a foundation that's willing to invest, although there are a lot out there and a lot of, again, coming back to health plans, a lot of community benefits um, are great places to get at least the startup costs to build the school-based health centers. Um, but we found that school-based health centers um, usually are, are able to bill for their services, um, um, especially in populations that have a high Medi-Cal population. Um, so oftentimes, especially the ones that are run by federally qualified health centers, or at least whose medical providers are from an FQHC, that they can bill Medi-Cal and sustain the services that way. Um, of course, there's some services that are less billable, particularly around health education and prevention, and so that's when people get more creative in terms of applying for grants um, or leveraging some of the school district LCAP dollars um, or, um, or other creative fundraising. Um, but in general, most of most school based health centers, um, most of their funding comes from third-party billing, and we actually have a whole section of our website and tools and webinars about um, funding and resources for school-based health centers that I can um, post as well. And, and then, I, yeah, Julia, I would also add, you mentioned the LCAP, which is our California funding, and tying the health interventions to reducing chronic absence definitely helps you with um, uh, drawing down those dollars. And um, I want to point out um, in terms of Title I and Title II um, uh, from the federal level that um, you can actually, uh, not for direct services, but for uh, working on uh, PD and for staff uh, development on chronic absenteeism, you can look at Title I and Title II. So um, if you're, and I think your district administ administrator should be able to help you figure that out. But those are other sources, um, and it, it may be a little easier than grant funding. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, we're um, all about maximizing both healthcare and educational funding. 
because um, it's so much more sustainable than having to, of course, write grants every year or every two years. Um, so mm -hmm. we have three minutes left, so I'm just going to close this up. I think we got to most of the questions, and we will definitely send out within a week um, all of this information as well as supplementary data and all of the resources that we've mentioned here. Um, so Cecilia, I don't know if you have the ball. Yes, do you want to um, walk us through your quick closing, and then I'll close this out? Sure. So one of the things we like to give people are door prizes, free resources they can take that would help them um, in doing their work better. And so I want to highlight a couple from Attendance Works, and I know you may have some to share also, Amy. So um, from Attendance Works, we have invested in creating three online learning modules called, that together we call Teaching Attendance. And so if you're trying to help um, anyone in your school building or, or in your school-based health center un understand why chronic absence, why care about it, and what can you do to create a culture of attendance and to use data to figure out who needs help, this is a great resource for you to uh, take. So we have these three modules, um, as I was saying, and I would encourage you to go and register for them. Once you're registered, you get your confirmation email, and you get a chance to take the modules and review key concepts, um, either with your attendance team, with your school-based health center, or just for yourself. I also want to share that um, the Healthy Schools campaign, one of our partners in our attendance awareness campaign nationally, um, has launched the Here and Healthy campaign. And they're inviting um, organizations to uh, really highlight that connection between health and attendance. And they also have a lot of free, wonderful resources that you may want to take a look at as well. So um, I think we've done lots and lots of questions. And I'm going to turn <laughs> yes. it to you, Amy, to um, uh, encourage people to attend your conference. Great. So yeah, just a quick plug um, for our conference that happens every year. This year it's May 9th and 10th um, in Redondo Beach down in Southern California. It's a really great place to meet all of the school-based health and school health leadership across the state, hear best practices, um, and dive much more deeply into these topics um, and get some resources and support. So more information on our website. There is an early bird discount through the end of March. There's also a member discount um, bringing, I want to say, the, mem the, the rate down to um, 150, I believe, is the discounted rate. So. Um, Definitely please join us. Um, definitely please reach out, check out our website, um, and we will be sending out the recording as well as the slides as well as lots of resources um, by um, a week from now. So thank you all so much for taking time out of your day, and um, we'll look forward to working with you all more in the future. Thank you so much, Amy and Julianne. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so Thank much for you. joining us, Cecilia and Julianne. Mm -hmm. So great to have such great presenters on such an important topic. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>